it's um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's just make sure we got it. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, let's go ahead and start. So, um, great to see all of you. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's, uh, I guess, our second post pandemic uh, uh, GeoMob. We'll see. Um, it's my first one back in London, so it's wonderful to be here. Um, big thank you to all of you who turned up, as all the, the, the old uh, members of the community, but also especially all the new people who, for whom it's the first year. Well, welcome. Um, I, of course, need to say a big thank you to our hosts, uh, GeoVation, once again for having us. Um, it's a big... Uh, uh, it's very welcome. Our, our event would not be possible without the generous support of, of GeoVation. So, Please, when we leave, make sure that you clean up and, um, and leave it in a, in a nice state so that we, we're able to get invited back. Um, uh, we have several sponsors who I need to thank. Um, without them, uh, the post talk beers would not be possible. Um, so, without further ado, Stephen, why are you? Stephen's over there representing Mapperi. Hi. Do you want to say how great yeah. Mapperi is? No, but what I do want to say is there are some of you who know me and have not yet sent one single map in the wild to Mapley. Deplorable. Mapley.org, have a look, and then send me a map. Have a look and check it out. Anyone here from Esri? Okay. Esri is a very interesting uh, new company coming out of California doing cool things. <laughs> uh, you know, check them out. Um, Ed, Ed I, I, I want to give a special note of thanks to Ed, not just as a sponsor, but as our audio-visual expert. Uh, Ed, thank you. This is your first event as a sponsor, so um, this is great. Welcome to the other side. Thank you very much. Yes, so Ed will be filming the talks tonight, and uh, we'll get those videos up shortly, no doubt. Uh, Geolytics, where is it? There you are. Come on, tell us what you do. Um, just help people decide where to put things. Okay, very nice. Uh, welcome as well as a sponsor. Your first event as a sponsor, we appreciate it. Um, we will we will toast your success later um, at the pub. I'm here representing OpenCage. If you need any geocoding, please let us know. And finally, of course, we had splash maps. Uh, I don't know where David is. He, I think he, he, he tweeted that he had missed his, the train, so he may or may not be coming. Um, but at the end of the evening, we will, we will vote for the splash maps uh, best speaker by show of hands. So um, that's kind of their contribution. They give a, a best speaker prize to the, to the speaker. So, um, right. After the talks, we're, we, we will have the talks, but then we will go to the Sutton Arms, where we will toast the success of the best speaker and console the non-best speakers and just generally uh, chat geo. So please do come along. It's only one minute away. Just follow the mob, and um, the drinks are generously paid for by our sponsors. So please do come along. Um, Future GeoMobs, uh, if any of you want to come to Barcelona next week, we'll be having an event. And in, in two or three weeks, we will have an event in Tel Aviv, if you can join us. Here in London, I'm not sure exactly when our next event will be, but maybe late, March, late May, early uh, June, mid-June, we'll see. That being said, it does depend on us having uh, speaker volunteers, so please volunteer to speak if you have an interesting geo project. So, or let us know who should be volunteering. So, um, final point is if you're not yet on the mailing list, please get on the mailing list. We send one email a month to keep you informed of the events. Um, if you're not li listening to the podcast, please start listening to the podcast where you can, we often interview um, people who have spoken or also just people who are doing interesting things in Geo. Um, so I think you'll enjoy it, give it a listen. 
I did want to give one final shout out before we dive into the talks to the uh, Google Summer of Code projects for OpenStreetMap. And Google very generously sponsors work on open source and open data projects. Um, and uh, OpenStreetMap has received, will receive funding for several of these projects. So if you're looking for an interesting project to work on this summer, maybe you're a student or something, please check that out. So without further ado, we have three speakers tonight. Uh, each speaker, the format is the same as always. Each speaker will, will have 10 to 15 minutes to tell us about their project. We'll have one or two questions, and that will be it. And then, then, then we'll head to the pub, and you can get into the nitty gritty now. So, let's dive in. Thanks again for coming. Our first speaker is Ed. Ed, where are you? Uh, uh, just in there. You go. Hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. No, thanks thanks for inviting me as well. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put this here. For my notes. Fine, right. if you want, but to move the slides. Oh, I see. Uh, hello, thanks for having me. I'm Ed, um, and with my colleagues, I've built Humap. Uh, Humap's a platform for telling stories about people and places and things. Um, and this evening, I'll tell you briefly about Humap, uh, and then I want to dive into one specific aspect. So, Humap, briefly, uh, we've worked on some really interesting projects. You may have come across Layers of London. This is kind of our flagship project at the moment. Um, it's a huge resource for exploring the history of London over the last 2,000 years. Uh, you can add your own stories, uh, you can add records and collections and overlays and compare that with um, stuff that other people have added and then there's a whole um, layer of um, professionally sourced um, overlays too, so geo-rectified images and data sets and stuff like that. Anyone can sign up, uh, and thousands have. Um, here's another project on the HUMAP platform. Um, the Refugee Maps, a project by the Holocaust Library to tell the stories of refugees from Nazi Germany uh, during, well, before and during the Second World War. Uh, HUMAP is really good for this because people can dive into stories uh, in a way that makes sense of place and time. Um, and they can build, begin to see relationships between records and images and stuff like that. And of course, right now, this project still has very current resonances, um, which is, makes it e e even more important to tell, I think. Um, feel free to pick my brains about any of that afterwards uh, and the HUMAP platform more generally. So some of, uh, m most of what I've shown you there is what I would kind of characterise as, um, as summative. It's mostly about showing people things, telling people things that already exist, um, finding a beautiful way to present stuff. But there's also another part to maps and digital engagement with maps, which is about creating them, and that's what I want to show you now. Um, so... We've spent a long time working in culture and heritage and that kind of field. And this particular um, project came about because um, we were working with uh, an archaeology company, I'll tell you about a bit later. The challenge is, um, the UK's got this amazing historical record, it goes back for thousands of years, it's all under the ground. Um, some, of, some things under the ground are known about, but quite a lot aren't. Um, there's something in the UK called the Historic Environment Record. Every um, council or, or local authority has a historic environment record. And they are um, variously good or bad, depending on the level of detail that people have recorded in them over the years. Um, it's a good start, but it's incomplete. And as you can see from the screenshots, the user experience of accessing this stuff is pretty old school and quite hard. Um, and I, I'm sure many of you in this room, this will be kind of obvious, but it's, it's, it's really difficult to dive into geographic data if, if you're not already a geo nerd in many cases. And that is a really significant challenge that has a knock-on implication on planning, conservation, sustainability, environmental work, all that sort of stuff relies on understanding what's already on the ground. 
So is there a way to improve the quality of this data? We worked with uh, an archaeology company called Dig Ventures. Now, they're a commercial outfit, um, but they are a social enterprise, and their remit is to encourage and enable participation in the archaeology. And they do some really interesting projects, raising money for digs and teaching people how to be archaeologists. Um, the process for identifying interesting new locations to dig or, or discover um, relies on a lot of groundwork. And in this case, um, it's often done using LIDAR, which is a bit like radar, but using light. They fly an aeroplane over and take very detailed, high-resolution plans of the landscape, which you can manipulate in various ways. Now, if you were looking at that and you knew what you were doing, traditionally, you'd use a piece of GIS software to identify the interesting places. You'd use QGIS or ArcGIS or whatever you wanted. Um, but that would preclude a huge corpus of people for whom GIS is completely unknown, and the uh, entire reason for Dig Ventures existing is to get citizen scientists interested in archaeology. So the challenge we found ourselves with was, is there a way that we can fix the quality of data under the ground through some sort of digital engagement project? Um, can we do it without requiring a load of technical complexity and GIS software? Uh, so this is what we came up with. Our solution is to build a, a web-based tool, which we call Placemaker, and it makes it dead easy for people to draw on a map. Um, and it's saved as geographic data. So these aren't pictures, these are geographic primitives stored in a database. The aim here is to make it as easy as using Microsoft Paint. Um, Basic tools, a user experience that's tailored for the task, no complexity, n not millions of buttons. Um, the pilot area that we did this in was, um, with, with Dig Ventures, was an area just south of Durham from the Brightwater Valley. There was already a historical environment record for this area, and the eventual aim is to feed back the work that we've been working on into that, into that record. Um, so Dig Ventures did the kind of user participation part. They got all the people involved. There was a 10 to 1 oversubscription, so 1,000 people applied for 100 places. And their approach um, was to teach people to interpret data in a way that made sense, and then let them go wild in a very structured way using this tool. So they did some online learning, and then the process of identifying a new site of interest is something like this. A project area is a square kilometre, which is about the right size to do a really detailed analysis of without losing the will to live. Um, you pick a square that hasn't been started, and then you start assessing your square um, across all the overlays that we've made available in the sidebar of placement. So you can see here, um, here is a LIDAR scan of a particular area, and somebody has drawn on some new polygons that represent areas of interest. And then after drawing their shape, it's important to record in a systematic way what the data that they're representing on the map is. So um, in this case, there's various fields that you can drop down and uh, adjust. And, and these, these are all... Um, dynamic in the software, so you know, there was actually a two-step process for this where the adventures did, we, we did a load of work with the volunteers and then fed the data into a, a machine learning algorithm and then put the results of that back into Placemaker and got people to assess how accurate the AI was. Um, so, so what you're looking at here is the second time around, the assessment, which is why there's lots of references to AI in the metadata drop. And everything's persisted to the database as soon as it's created, so you can come back and finish off later. And that, that's kind of part of the workflow of this. It's supposed to be dead easy and avoid all the usual pitfalls of, of geographic software. And the results were really impressive. Um, people with limited or no experience of either geographical software or archaeology were able to produce results which could be validated professionally. Um, they found 
nearly two and a half thousand new sites that haven't ever been recorded, but were certainly of archaeological interest, uh, which was 60% more than ever had, ever had been found in the Brightwater Valley. And importantly, through a, um, a series of metrics, fidelity, accuracy, and completeness, the results were more valid than the historical environment record was in the first place. So this really shows the power of, of um, citizen science, of community involvement in, a, in something which could actually be quite technically challenging, but which is made simple through the use of software. So, for us, placemakers, we want placemakers to be a commercial part of our business. And we think that there's a lot of applications outside this specific use case. Um, a good example of something we did as part of the Layers of London project was we worked with the LSE to digitise areas of the Booth poverty map from the early, early 1900s. Now, had this tool been available, it would have been perfect for the job because you could draw around all, all the streets and identify what areas of deprivation um, were associated with them. And, and we think that there's another interesting use case to do with drawing the roots of objects over time. So something that lay people find quite hard with geographical software is like saying something got from here to here and identifying it visually. Um, and adding a kind of temporal component to records that I showed you earlier on UMAP is something that we've got in the pipeline. And we're also working on a grant proposal with Dig Ventures themselves to turn Placemaker into something more fully featured for citizen archaeology. Um, we think that that specific use case is, is quite important. Um, and it could significantly reduce costs for archaeological, archaeological surveys and um, improve the quality of them. So, so in summary then, the most important learning we've taken from this project is that it is possible to make drawing on a map accessible to non-experts. And with care and attention to a solid user experience, the results can be as valid as any other method of work. Um, I'm here all evening going for geo beers with you later, and my colleagues Martin and Natalie are here as well, so I'd be delighted to chew the fat over any of that. Um, and feel free to pepper questions in my direction now or later. Yeah, hi. Well, from Graf and the um, oh, um, I'm, I'm interested to know how do you manage the um, the editorial part of it as an oversight? Yeah, so I think this kind of uh, product is always going to require a human component. And I think if you're engaged, I mean, our, our work in community engagement more generally shows that there is a direct corollary between the amount of effort put in on the part of the people doing the community engagement and the quality of the engagement that is made. So in the case of this project, um, if I go back a few slides, the, um, the process is that you draw on, you, first of all you do some e-learning, and then you draw on a map, and then your, your stuff is checked um, by somebody who is trusted. So I think I think that's always going to be necessary because otherwise you could end up in a, in a mess. It's basically like in, I guess, like in West, in the West of map where you will have editors that look at the yeah, the, yeah, and then they validate it. That's right. So I think so. I think the use case for this is primarily around closed or, or, or semi-closed groups of people for whom uh, that editorial oversight is part of their process. Hi there. Okay, so um, sorry, yeah, I, I, I used a slightly ambiguous phrase there. Um, the process of identifying areas of interest is uh, a matter of comparing and contrasting these different reference layers. I've only shown the, in fact, in an early one, I think there's a reference to an earlier. Maybe not. Um, the answer is you have to learn how to compare and contrast the LIDAR data, which has several different representations, one with, with trees and one without trees, and one as if it were looking at the ground and one as if it were looking from above and various other things, alongside historical OS maps, a modern base map, 
whatever, and, and, and a satellite map as well. So you might end up looking at something like a hedgerow, and then you realise that actually the LIDAR data is showing that under the hedge is a ditch, or next to the hedge is a ditch, and that might be an indication of something. Um, but I'm straying into an area of archaeology about which I know very little. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Yeah, I echo the comments are really like, nice looking tool, and uh, I can see how it would be so useful. Uh, I was wondering just below the lid, um, what's the database? Like, uh, uh, it's post-GIS. Nice. Uh, yeah. So what, what kind of like interesting analysis are you doing uh, on top? Uh, very little, actually. The, anal the, the analysis is largely... The, the outcome of this is largely some geographic primitives to do analysis with. So, um, in the case of this particular project, we took the we took the data and, um, as part of a, a set, kind of separate from us producing this tool, um, they fed it into a machine learning algorithm as a training data set. Um, but they found actually that the that part of their kind of exploratory project didn't work so well because the training data set needed to be 100% accurate in order to produce valid results on the way back out. So the idea was supposed to be, okay, people draw some known good things on that, feed it into an AI as a training data set, the AI looks at another uh, area and suggests things which are probably going to be archaeologically interesting. Now what, what we found was the data coming out of the machine learning algorithm was quite poor because the data going in was not 100% accurate. So although they were, I think 94% like accurate isn't accurate enough for a, for a trained data set. So, but the world's your oyster in terms of what you could, what you could do with this stuff because it's all just geodata. Yeah. Any more questions? One more. Two more. Just a quick one, more, have you ever heard of a couple of RKI, medical mm. artist framework? Uh, yeah, in fact, she's, uh, Iris is who, uh, who did the, uh, the analysis. I don't know if you did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Well done. All right, welcome, Dustin. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm Dustin. I'm here to tell you tonight about the uh, abridged but entirely truthful story of a project called Amy Street. Um, so first, my background. Uh, when I was a kid, I played a Nintendo 64 game called Banjo Kazooie, and it changed my life. It was the coolest game ever. Um, really awesome environments. Uh, these are not my maps, but, but maps of the, some of the levels that people drew. Um, and this game made me want to make uh, computer games, and so I, I did, kind of. Um, I learned a language called Perl and uh, tried to build these like text-based roguelike things for a couple of years. Um, and through this, kind of got really interested in like routing and, uh, and, and pathfinding algorithms, things like that. Um, then in college, uh, kind of a sequence of coincidences led to me um, producing a, a map of the campus uh, from just walking around. And uh, this is before I knew about OpenStreetMap. Uh, shortly after finishing this, I discovered OpenStreetMap, um, which meant that uh, I'd spend the next couple of years um, doing this underground project uh, to build a traffic simulator um, called Aorta. And uh, the idea of this thing was like, one day we'll have all autonomous cars and there'll be no human drivers. Um, what kind of crazy things can happen? Uh, I regret that project in, in many ways. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then I, I moved to Seattle, and I'll just say that like a lot of things changed. Uh, things went wrong, things went right. Um, but a bunch of things led, led to me wanting to, uh, to create this thing called AB Street. And so um, I'll kind of like start over and, and describe like what AB Street tries to do. Uh, so OpenStreetMap has really fantastic data out there, but looking at this image, you don't really, you don't really see the full richness of it. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to do with AB Street was just like show um, a street map that, that captures all of the detail that's actually in OSM. Uh, so you'll notice like the, the red lanes um, are, are bus only. Uh, you can see like cycle lanes both separated from the road and painted on the, uh, and, ju and just separated by paint. Um, and it, yeah, so AB Street tries to, to get the, the real uh, picture of, of what, what things look like on the ground. 
Um, and a lot of the times, like the, the sort of data that you're interested, uh, the, the data that you might need to, to do transportation analysis um, isn't really an OSM. So on the left, uh, you have parking lots that have um, like the shape of the parking lot mapped out and individual aisles running through, but you don't really know how many cars can park there. Uh, you know, like placing rectang rectangles and making sure they don't overlap isn't too bad. So the thing on the right is what AB Street does to, to sort of guess the capacity of that. Um, and similarly, at, uh, at traffic signals, you need to know um, the timing and what, what movements are allowed by default. And there is like zero public data on this uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, no one's willing to give it up. But so AB Street just kind of makes it up and, and tries tries to make a to do a best guess. Uh, although I did spend about a month, uh, a little bit before COVID, um, wandering around Seattle and trying to, to get this uh, stuff with like pen and paper and a stopwatch, and it was a very terrible idea. Never never gonna try that again. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so AB Street brings in uh, other public data, not just OSM. So if you're say designing cycle networks, you really need to know where the hills are. Um, and so the King County LiDAR data um, is used to produce like a contour map that you can use as an overlay. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess like one of the things I try, I've tried to do with AB Street is like make something that's really um, engaging, especially to people that like, live in a place. And so uh, in part of Seattle called Capitol Hill, there's a few like rainbow crosswalks that are kind of infamous. And um, I like tag these in OSM and then add in rendering support, support to that to like really show, yeah, to, to, to show my love of Seattle, let's say. Um, but yeah, so what I wanted to do with AB Street was uh, ask transportation questions, and I'll kind of get to what those questions are in a bit. Um, but to do that, that means uh, there has to be a simulation, so uh, or that there have to be things moving around. And so AB Street, uh, on top of that map, has a, a traffic simulation built in that um, uh, has cyclists, drivers, buses, and uh, pedestrians moving around. Um, and I really wish I could uh, show you animation, but the like the little guy on the left is uh, is like a pedestrian with a thought level saying like, "Oh, I'm walking up a really steep hill right now." Um, and uh, on the right is a is a bus with a very funny shape. Uh, it turns out if you want to draw um, vehicles going around a curve, if you just like do it as a rectangle and use the like the front point and, and pick that angle, like if you have a bus going around a corner, like you it looks like a, a clock just like spinning and like hitting everything. It, it looks completely ridiculous, and so. Uh, this is the, the, the only reason why uh, AB Street renders vehicles as like thickened lines that follow the, follow the road because like, yeah. Um, and okay, so like I guess the, the field of traffic simulation is very like academic or very professional and very uh, dry. But I wanted to create something that like regular people use and get get engaged with. And so like even though it's an agent based simulation, like those those uh, those people have faces and names and nicknames and ages. Uh, and so like played around with like procedural generation techniques to. Uh, yeah, to try to, to create more more of a character, um, and then for a while, AB Street was like trying to be uh, a bit of a game to kind of get people involved in redesigning their city. Um, and so, a friend from college uh, made the characters on the right. And you had kind of like a tutorial mode and a story mode and stuff like that. Um, but okay, so we have this this uh, traffic simulation. So we can follow individual agents moving around. You can measure a whole bunch of stuff about them uh, and and their their travel through the day. Um, and you can do the same thing for the infrastructure. So we can. Uh, you know, set up traffic counters at a traffic light and ma measure as much data as you want about the delay of agents moving through it. Um, and unlike the real world, there's no, you know, there's no resource cost. Like you can collect all the data you want, and actually, that's that's a blessing and a curse because what do you, how do you usefully present all of that, uh, your conclusions about that data to the user? Uh, very open question. Um, but yeah, so the main point of PV Street is uh, the real world is not designed well in cities. Um, there's way too much space uh, given to, to motor vehicles and like this this isn't going to work. Uh, so you know we have this like arterial road um, with parking on both sides and two general purpose travel lanes like this is ridiculous. Uh, and so AB Street has a, a street mix inspired um, editor where you can just drag the lane, lanes around kind of uh, make, make the, the world that you want to see. Um, so then on top of this, uh, oh, and, and also um, you know everyone has the their one traffic light that they like they really hate. Uh, this thing gives you an interface to just like fill around with the timing and see if you can see if you can do better than the uh, the city engineers. Um, but yeah, so uh, we can run a traffic simulation before any of your changes to the map, and then it, you know this is the this is simulation, so we can uh, repeat exactly the same input and and only change the stuff that you changed on the roads. Uh, and then for every single trip that we simulate, we can measure a bunch of differences and say you know these trips get faster, uh, these trips experience more uh, more danger of like cars. Uh, being close to, to bike stop protection, things like that. Um, 
and you know, like from those individual patterns, you can uh, you can draw big conclusions and say, you know, this change in theory helps this group and hurts this group, something like that. That that, that was the idea. Um, and yeah, so so the name AB Street, I think like a lot of people have been very confused about it, uh, but it's meant to be like AB test, uh, which is a concept in I think it's like the tech industry where. Uh, you know, somebody wants to like sell you more of a product, and so they'll they'll try two different versions of a website and see which one has more engagement. So um, I'm going to do the same thing with uh, with the way the city and the built environment works. Um, so yeah, I guess like this is kind of a, a very uh, tall order to like take OpenStreetMap data and try to like squeeze this level of detail out of it. Um, and you know, sometimes it's worked out pretty well. So like the thing on the right is a is a dual carriageway with like light rail uh, in between. This is in Tempe, Arizona, and like after. A gratuitous amount of effort, I got it like rendering reasonably as one junction in AB Street. Um, but like usually this this does not work at all. Uh, this is like somewhere else in Arizona. Um, if you're familiar with OSM data, like uh, complex junctions are not mapped in a way that's remotely reasonable. So you know, uh, on the left is something in Taiwan, on the right is another bit of Seattle. Like these are these are hard problems to solve. Uh, and this is in Bristol. Uh, yeah, in, in short, like. Sometimes this works well, but like it, it does not always work. Uh, and of course, this this isn't just like an aesthetic thing. This this affects the traffic simulation. So uh, the two the two drivers in the middle are like in some kind of like standoff. They're just they're never going to move. They're both trying to turn against each other. Um, and you know this this, this gets really bad. Uh, so like if you ever find a traffic simulation that that uh, promises this level of detail, like point it at complex areas and see see how it performs. Because like this this is a hard thing to solve, um, and yeah. So I guess like the original vision of, of AB Street was like random citizens living somewhere can say, um, here I want to make these changes to the roads and show that like it's not going to be traffic apocalypse and it can actually be better to, to get people out of cars. Uh, but the, the thing is that the traffic simulation can't give you good results uh, because getting this thing to work is just it's impossible. Um, and so uh, there was a sequence of like pivots. I realized that the the same. Uh, Stuff that I had kind of built up software-wise can be used to study other stuff. And so, uh, for example, 15-minute neighborhoods. You you start somewhere and you want to know where can I walk in 15 minutes. Um, and so, like for example, uh, maybe you want a, a better walk score. Like you want to find a house that uh, is within a 15-minute walk of both uh, some building involving culture and some building involving a supermarket. Um, only the, the red houses uh, match that criteria, and everywhere else um, you pretty much like force into car dependency. Uh, so this is just like another tool kind of quickly built on top of the same same stuff. Uh, and then, uh, I guess uh, about a year ago, uh, we, we took a month and built this thing called 15 Minute Santa. So originally, AB Street was like sort of supposed to be a game, and finally, we, we actually made a game uh, where you you drive around and deliver presents at Santa. You get more points if you deliver to high density housing, and you have to refuel from uh, from places selling food. And so whenever you have like the suburban wasteland of, of uh, no mixed use development, like it's very hard. And this game kind of teaches you that. Um, and so, like, I, I released this thing. Or this, this was the uh, some feedback that I got about 15 minutes Santa, uh, and and in short, like, I was trying to get people from the the community, especially in Seattle, like, interested in re reimagining what space could be, and like, they just weren't having it. Like, I, I yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So let's let's pivot again. Um, I, I like I talked to the cycling groups in uh, in Seattle that, that are like advocating for, for different stuff and like they they tell me that AB Street is complicated. I agree. So it's like okay, let's let's build something just uh, dedicated to to planning better cycle networks and and show the gaps, uh, let people quickly paint the, the bike lanes they want, um, and even do kind of a little bit of the, the magical mode shift question and say like if you build out these cycle networks uh, based on data that we have about where people currently try to drive and how long those trips take. Um, you know, let's let's calculate how many people might actually change their mind and start biking because you've you've made it safe and reasonable. Uh, you know, and and so like, I thought this would kind of be finally the breakthrough where, where people start using this stuff for advocacy and and no, uh, nobody's using this. <laughs> uh, so okay, finally uh, I I got out of Seattle. Um, I, I moved here a few months ago uh, and I started to work at the Alan Turing Institute, um, and I'm extremely happy to be here because uh, I think the like yeah. The UK is, is a lot more invested in active travel, and I think this type of work makes sense to do here. Um, so a couple months ago, I was watching uh, like a webinar video by uh, a designer named Brian Deegan, and he was designing low traffic neighborhoods uh, and, and showing how like his public consultation process works. And he was literally drawing uh, circles and arrows in like AutoCAD, and I was like, "This is we can do better." Uh, and so uh, the tool that I've been working on at the Turing is um, is focused on designing low traffic neighborhoods. 
Uh, and so, you know, if you have a lot of uh, drivers trying to cut through the residential streets that weren't really designed for, for a large amount of traffic, uh, this tool can kind of predict that and then gives you the ability to just drop a filter, like a, a modal filter in the middle of the street to stop people from driving through. Um, and so you can, uh, you can use this to sort of study the detours that might happen and see if the scheme is actually effective or not. Um, and unlike all the other stuff that I've described, like people are actually starting to use it and are, are kind of interested in it actively, which is like all I've ever wanted. <laughs> So I'm, I'm quite happy about that. Um, the only little bit I'll say about the, uh, how Adu Street works, like there's plenty of detail that I'm happy to talk about, but um, it's written in a language called, called Rust, and the consequence of that that I uh, didn't intend from the beginning is that um, it compiles to WebAssembly, which means everything runs in the browser. Originally, this was not meant to, to be on the browser, but uh, it turns out people don't like installing stuff, and so this has been very, very useful. Um, and there are pieces of Adu Street uh, code base that we're starting to split out and make, make available for use in other projects if you're interested in Lane and intersection geometry, for example. Um, I guess about how the project has worked, uh, I've been doing this for three and a half years before joining the turn, um, and this was never meant as a business. Uh, and I guess like through that time, the project got different attention at, at different points, and like I've, I think I counted, it's like about 150 different like long conversations I had with people who wanted to use AB Suite for something, or like hire me, or something like that, and like uh, frankly, it was like exhausting dealing with that and, and trying to figure out what people wanted and, and like align with, with my vision for stuff. Uh, but I will say that like a few of those people really pulled through. Um, and so this is a, this is like what I consider the, the AV Suite team. Uh, you and Michael and Robin um, like stuck around with the project and like helped develop into something into something real. Um, and uh, this is what AV Street looked like before Ewan got to it. So Ewan's the UX designer. Uh, note that, like, of course, this is like extremely ugly, but also it's it's just not usable. It, it resembles the uh, the text-based game I showed you at the very beginning, where all of the the possible controls you could want to do on this map are just like squeezed in on the side. Because that's the only thing I know how to design. Uh, and I, I'll, I, I have no words. Um, I, I, I'm proud of this. Uh, yeah. So um, what I'm working on now at the Turing is uh, a lot more stuff focused on, for example, census data, uh, and I can talk about that later. Um, I also want to finally properly solve the problem of better road and intersection geometry in, in, in uh, OpenStreetMap, and I have some ideas. Um, and I'm also very interested in uh, helping people design public transit systems that kind of work well for them. And you may know a bunch of, uh, or a few different companies that help, that provide software to do exactly this kind of thing. Uh, but that software is proprietary and not available to the public, and the public has opinions on this. And so I want, uh, like, everything that I build. Um, is completely open source. Uh, it's free. It's meant to be easy to use. That anybody can use it. And so, if you, um, you know, live in a place and you're opinionated about it, uh, you know, you have the power to kind of express the proposals for changes that you want. Uh, and so, if uh, yeah, if, if you're convinced by this mission and you want to join me for whatever form that means, uh, let's let's talk about it. Um, thank you. For the longest time, I tried to punt on this problem and just like bring in external data that people uh, have. So in Seattle, there's a, a group that produces a model called Soundcast. Uh, it's like a group of 50 people, and they have like hundreds of pages of differential equations and calibration stuff. Like they've done a very good job of modeling transportation in the region, and I can just like read that in and use it. Uh, unfortunately, everywhere else in the world, this data does not exist. And so like for the UK, I'm bringing in 2011 data and doing my own very bad uh, activity modeling. Um, and it's like it's only home to work trips, not you know, uh, people going shopping or, or visiting friends and stuff. And so the results are, are terrible. Uh, and now that I'm working at the Turing, I'm starting to look at this more. But yeah. Uh, just talk to me. Like, 
I think that the GitHub has like beginner friendly issues or something, but like probably these are out of date. Um, because this is such a very like broad project and people have like different interests and different skills, just like let's let's talk and, and find a find a thing. I have a question. Why why Rust? I mean was it was it computationally difficult and therefore best to uh, it wasn't like a super principled carefully thought out thing. Like it was the, the language had uh, had hit one one oh and I was like I wanted to try it because I had tried it a few years back and it was like really bad, but then I tried it again and it was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing is, I knew that I didn't want to use anything with garbage collection because the project that I did in college was written in Scala using the uh, Java virtual machine, and like, um, it was kind of okay to start. And then eventually, like, there was all this uh, garbage collection stuff that I had like no control over, and so Rust kind of seemed like a good thing to go with. Yeah. Okay, I, um, I know that some of the earlier projects were very geographically constrained because of all the pre-processing. So you can try the uh, the low traffic neighborhood. It's available now on the web. Just add ltm dot org to it. Um, so the AB Street model is still like you have to import. You have to like draw a boundary around the study area you want and import it. Uh, that import process is pretty easy. You can't do it on the web, but you can do it um, in the downloaded version, and it should take like a minute or something. Uh, I would eventually like to get to the point where just like all of the world is imported, and you can like scroll around, but that's 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 hard. Yeah. All right, very nice. very nice. <laughs>
you're really into the SCP stuff. That's where the name came from, our CEO. is also a long time uh, mapping geek. He had experience in a number of the early location uh, based startups. Um, worked at Yahoo and, and is now a uh, Google Maps. You know, started a company to be a Google Maps recently. I thought some of you might appreciate that little reference. All right, so focus today. We're going to talk about uh, what we do. Of course, in the world of banks, you know there's branches and there's ATM machines. People need to know where to put them in. Sadly, maybe rationalize them when they're closing them and those sorts of things. Not going to talk too much about that. That's probably bread and butter, geographic market segmentation, target marketing, all of that. Really good stuff. Uh, but maybe I can show you something a little different. Maybe you haven't thought about things in this way before. So we'll talk about uh, using geographic technology and knowing who the customer is. There's obligations there when a bank signs you up that they have to do to make sure you are who you say you are and you live where you say you live and so forth. Uh, business oriented, similar things. And um, my baby is all around transaction enrichment. That's, that's what I spend my time with. So the last presentation I did, these slides were presented. I took the, the logo off. It is our customer. It's Moniz, if you've heard of that. Has anyone heard of Moniz? One of the challenger banks. Um, I, and the last, it was two years and six days ago, I did my last event. And they presented these two slides. I haven't had a chance to ask them if it was still OK if they were up to date. So I took, I took, they won't mind me telling you who it is, but I took the logo off just in case. A real simple thing. It may sound odd, but people screw up typing in their own address all the time. So if you know, and not just Google that has this, lots of people have this. If you type ahead, you see an address fill in, and you're typing the address or regular Google search, and you see things filling in as you type it. That can be a big help in the person trying to sign up for a bank account uh, with monies. And um, you know, and, and, and one of the things about this company and, and their target market is they got started trying to provide banking. Their target was lots of people coming to the UK for the first time don't have a bank account. It's kind of hard to get one. I went through that 21 years ago. I needed to show up at the bank with a letter from my employer and say, could I please have an account? I'm going to be getting a paycheck. So they uh, solved that problem. So typing in addresses could actually challenge if, uh, challenge if English isn't your uh, first language. And they may also want, very simply, they may also want to, you know, you say where you live. Well, can we please track your phone for a little bit? Oh, OK, you really do live there. That's good. And then that helps the application mm -hmm. fulfillment process. Okay. Uh, SME banking, this is, uh, this is a little bit different, but imagine in parts of the world where you, you're a bank, you want to give loans to small businesses, and maybe the information sent to the financial authority isn't necessarily great. Maybe you can't really trust it that much. But with Google and Google Maps, they can help you know how busy the place is. You can look at where it is, of course, what kind of access it has, what the ratings and reviews are for it, and all that can help you decide whether or not to give a loan. So we've helped companies like that. It's kind of a, kind of a fun application. So uh, try to um, operationalize that, take the rich information from the Google Maps platform, particularly the Google Places database. And uh, you know most businesses are in there. So you want to be in there because you want to be found. Right? Any type of business where people walk in and need to find or travel to. Uh, so it's a pretty good, uh, pretty interesting solution. OK, another question. How many of you have ever looked at your bank statement and said, oh my goodness, what was that? Right? Happens to everybody. The Information that's provided when you tap the card on the terminal, maybe not quite as bad a problem when you're paying for something online, but still, some of those are really, really difficult to read. Amazon expresses themselves in tens of thousands of different ways. You know, on, on your bank statement when you make a when you make a purchase. So what we did is built a product to take that, turn it into this, and most importantly. I think some of you are wondering, 
Where's the maps? Uh, this as well. So you can start with a little basic list of information, get the logo for the business, show that, get more detail for the business, um, show it on the map. And the idea behind this, I can share with you a, a recent case study. Uh, Nationwide Bank is our, our customer. Very lucky for me because it happened to be my primary bank. Uh, and uh, we managed to, to work with our partner Visa to, uh, to sell them. And uh, they implemented this and reduced, uh, they did a, they, this is the first customer of ours to really do this really carefully. They analyzed how often they were getting calls. Hey, I don't recognize this transaction. I think I've been after whatever. Uh, they reduced those calls by 30%, resulting in taking out people from, uh, resulting in reduced effort in the call center so they could do other things. It's not like they get rid of people, it's like they could do more productive things. So a real hard ROI for them, and, and they got it much more quickly than, than they actually anticipated. Uh, so that's the benefit of doing that. The presentation said, the earlier presentations, there was a theme about how they would, how they were trying to make something easier that was really hard and maybe get a, a, a bigger audience to do it. Well, here, what we're trying to do is help the average consumer better understand their bank statement and reduce that anxiety from transactions you don't recognize. You know, what the heck was this? Click, oh yeah, it's a chip shop around the corner. I was wasted, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, that, that sort of thing. Here's a couple more screenshots. You know, we're happy to, to share these, these slides afterwards to some of the um, customers that work. But there's quite a big list of uh, up uh, at, the, at the front there. Okay, I'm only doing 10 minutes, and that was 955. <laughs> 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 Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually nervous. It's the first time I've done a presentation of this in two years and six months. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, um, it's really nice. Now I have a whole my capital and tax statement, my, my capital and tax statement, and things like that. It's, it just shows me where I've been, where I spent. I don't think they're our customer, but good to be. It's not the only successful sales, but it always looks so crappy. And, uh, ah, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, but, um, so all this makes absolute sense in, uh, in retail banking. I was curious, did you find any applicability for all the, anything geospatial in the um, investment banking area? I know this is a bit sensitive, but did you find anything in that? In, I, uh, I believe there is, but we're not working on it. We're, we're working on this, and then there's natural extensions to this. Once we know who the company is, well, we can go and get other data. But not, not so much investment banking. Yeah, KYC there is totally but, different. But there are geospatial things for investment You don't find that I spoke actually to people in my industry, and there's absolutely, until now, I've gone zero applicability. Kind of embarrassed me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, that, maybe that's an opportunity. Yeah. Because certainly, if you're going to, there's lots of different kinds of investment banking, but you may want to analyze the perspective company you're going to in employee base, customer base, those sorts of things. You get access to all kinds of data when you're doing that process. So. Yeah. When you're enriching the data, are you proxying all the stuff from Google and mixing in other sources as well? Or are you are you primarily just, I mean, what's, what are the mechanics? Where, where's the data flow? You see what I mean? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of different ones there. When we present the first list, we're using data from our own data stores, and we're acquiring and accumulating data. And uh, the logos are something we have to acquire and accumulate. We don't get those from Google. It's not a service they provide. Um, and for us, it's all about the transaction messages that we get. What's that sloppy message? That's, that's like our unit of what we look at. And then how good can we, can we clean it up? Uh, on the theme of customer involvement, just to, to point out, we have an endpoint in our API, and that's a technical term, we have a way for people to send us information from the end consumer about their transaction. 
So let's say we, we gave a logo, but the company changed it. We got the wrong one. We can be told directly by a consumer, which is a pretty, pretty good way. We call it crowdsourcing, of course. And there's some hands up. OK, you're there. First one is about the kind of location finding for those transactions. Mm -hmm. so where they do. Still get surprised in things like mm -hmm. online transactions, which I'll be saying here in London is all because of something to do with the internet addressing it all think the transaction was in Birmingham or something. Do you find it's reliable facts? Well we have to manage for that. I mean one of the arts of this is to not try to locate an online transaction and identify them. And some banks can tell you that, but it's a how most of them actually don't bother sending us that info because it's so bad. So we have to figure it out. <laughs> Amazon's a perfect example. If you left it, Amazon, your Amazon transaction might be in Luxembourg. That's the regional office for Amazon. So that's the country code assigned to that transaction. We won't try to make it. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, that's the first Do you know if that was reduction in just the false negatives or, or were there you know, people calling up where they didn't have anything to worry about? How much do you know about whether people have stopped calling who shouldn't be calling? Now it was, they're saying to us, hey, we're getting 30% less calls of this nature that are querying about the transaction. I don't know if they know to that level of detail, but they've seen a, a nice significant I'm interested in, in this concept of um, using things like Google stars and ratings to then inform what you do out of the world. What is it like? Clearly, if you don't have experts from Google or Maps, you would have kind of the, well, the understanding of, of, of some of the reasons why Google would put three stars or five stars because it's not, it's not just accounting and divided by it. Like there's some statistical methods that go into that. And then, like, the ethics intersection with the fact that, you know, you're now, it's kind of like, it's like crowdsourcing that this person is black and they decide not to put them alone. Like if someone, you know, if, if Google has a bad rating, that could have come about from all kinds of bad agents and now this person's not being alone. So it seems to me like there's like some heavy ethical, is that, is that right. allowed in the, is that, I, mean, I don't know about here, but it seems like someone would be some legislation not. Are you just allowed to have random information inform how someone can receive a loan? Is that, like, is that something? So this is business, not personal. And but you're right, you know, and, and the bank doing this wants to make loans. They're not trying to exclude people who say they're excluded. They want to make loans. And they find they can't do it reliably with the current information that's available. But if they get more information, they can actually make more loans. So it's actually possible for this to expand the successful lending that they do. But that doesn't mean your concerns aren't valid. They, they, those sorts of things could end up Google ratings get gained. You know? Yeah. You know, somebody with a restaurant right here could say, you know, hundred good friends, go trash a restaurant over there. So there's all sorts of things you have to worry about. It's, it's not so super easy. And these things have to be tested. But, but as a provider of the location services, you guys take a stake in that kind of ethical conceptualization of like well if, 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 our if the bank is concerned about it we'll discuss it with them and see what we need to do to mitigate it uh, but this is ultimately the bank the bank's application uh, that's not what i described there is not so much a product like the the what we call merchant reconciliation system mm -hmm. or, or transaction enrichment but yeah so and every one of those will be different and in and, and different markets. The thing I'm showing you there, that was not the same. Yep. How confident are you that this is Question for Ed Parsons. <laughs> 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 Everybody can make up safety. But I mean, you're a network representative that's taking that data and giving it to someone else, and you have to give them confidence in the data. All of these projects have to be evaluated and tested. It's not just something that you do internally. So, 
So there's a pilot. That's a very cool teaching pilot. Not one of these things ever happens without a pilot. Nobody just goes and does this and launches it. That wasn't asking my question. I apologize. You're looking at, I'm asking about a globe's worth of data that's been collected by Google, and then you have Well, let me be clear. I don't know how much Google will promise that all the data is exactly the same, which is why I made the joke that it's an Ed Parsons question. I don't yeah. know the answer. If you're taking that data and making another product, that you're then asking some other organization to make a decision. No, 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 no. We're helping, really? we're helping a company build a solution that they test first, and if it works, they will use it. Wow. So you pass about how to to make a decision. But it's a magnet quality ethics. If I may, always good to leave some points for discussion. Why don't we, uh... What solution are you providing? Are you providing a solution that doesn't do that? Are you providing a solution that doesn't do that? That's that's my question then, back. Right? So, you build a tool for a company or consulting services, you can just, you know, get mapping for a second, and you're building something for someone else. So that's somehow... Well, you'll, you'll put service levels in, and you'll have agreements on, on accuracy and levels of quality and so forth. Well, that's part of the agreement. Every single one is different. Isn't the argument also that? Yes, yes. <laughs> take, take it to the pub. Take it to the pub. OK, come sorry. On. Come on, come on. Thanks very much, Tom. Thank that's, you. Uh, Now we have to vote, but first, David, show us, show us what the winner is going to get. Uh, right, well, okay, so the, um, what the winner gets might look a bit nondescript. It's that. So it's a voucher, and that means they can sit at home, they can work out a map of absolutely anywhere on the planet, and we'll produce it on a fabulous fabric for them. And it could be anywhere, and it will be very much adventurous and scale. Um, but these are very specific. Uh, London, almost exclusive for GMOG, but not really. They're kind of prepared for uh, uh, a big event that we're starting off in Birmingham uh, on the weekend. If anyone's available, go to the NEC. Um, but these net, these uh, toggle neck warmers are brilliant for people who are doing exercise and that sort of stuff. And a very original map of London, featuring those. Buy them from me later. <laughs> right. All right. Okay, vote so vote so. once, please. One hand on only. We had Ed from Umau. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. And then we have Dustin. I've drawn a conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom. But I'm sort of to that. Right. All right. <laughs> it looks like it's Dustin. It is. Wait, guys, come on. Let's get the celebratory. All right. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> A, a big thank you to all of our speakers for taking the time to come uh, present, and a thank you to the Splash Maps for the prize. Um, and again, thank you to our to our hosts here at Geovation for having us. So that concludes the talk part of the evening, and now we can go do the arguing over beers. So <laughs> pick up your stuff, clean up your stuff, um, and let's go. There's a map. And I, oh, sorry, sorry. Final point. You will to drink the beers. You will need my business card, which uh, I have here. So um, I will hand those out. And uh, yeah, I will see you at the pub. Thank you, everyone, for coming. See you at the next one. Oh, Tom. And, uh, Welcome back. Welcome back. Hey, it's a nice new feature. Like it. Hey. How are you, sir? Come on, we do it properly. I'm just trying to keep out of the germs for a while. If this show goes to itself, then I'm full of the end of that problem.
Well done, Ed. Did it? Did it work? I mean, are we? Are we in business? Now we should work well. Time will.